When the Legends Die, Chapter 48, Part 2 It was almost morning when he came to his camp. He saw the sheltering tarp in the thin moonlight, and he heard the sound of the creek. He drank, and he opened his pack and lay down and wrapped his blanket around him. He rested, dozing, only half sleeping, and when the flush of dawn lightened the sky, he sat up, knowing what he must do. He put the blanket aside, stripped himself naked, and went to a place where the creek made a pool among the rocks. He stepped into the pool, and the cold black water drove fiery needles into his legs. He scooped handfuls of water and splashed it on his belly and chest, then sat down in the knee-deep pool. The cold was like knives at his testicles and knotted his whole belly. As the current piled against his shoulders, the pain sliced at his very vitals. Then the pain began to ease, and he scrubbed himself with a handful of sands from the pool's bottom. He bathed, and as the sun was about to rise, he got out and rubbed life back into his legs. Then he sat on a rock facing the east, and as the sun rose, he chanted the song to a new day, chanting the sun and the earth and everything between. Then, naked and unarmed, he started up the mountain. All morning he made his way through the brush and timber over the rocks and ledges and gravelly slopes. Noon came and he stopped to rest, and he looked up at the sun and thought of how it, round it is and how round is the path it follows. He looked at the sky, the blue roundness of the sky, and he looked at the roundness of the aspen trunks. He closed his eyes and sang a silent chant to the roundness of all things, the great roundness of life. When he had finished, he lay on his belly, close to the earth, and let the sun beat on his back. He lay there a long time, the earth and the sun holding him between them. Then he went on. The last part was a difficult climb. It was late afternoon when he reached the top, already deep dusk in the valleys. He stood there and watched the sun sink behind a cloud on the horizon and sent flaming colors that raced across the sky, gold, then pink, then purple. He watched, but he sang no song, made no chant. He'd come to listen, not to talk. When the colors had gone and the first stars appeared, he went down the mountainside till he came to a clump of wind-warped junipers with a mat of prickly needles beneath them. He crawled in and lay down, weak with fasting and fatigue. His muscles ached, his joints throbbed, and the night chill bit at his flesh. The prickles in his bed bit into his skin like tiny coals of fire, but he slept. Dreams came. First came unwanted dreams. He was in the corral at the agency, and he was riding a huge, frosty bear. It lunged from the chute, and he lashed it with a rawhide quirt and raked it with his spurs. It lunged three times, side jump spun. But now it was no longer a bear, but a bronc, a big roan bronc. It fell, and he was trapped in the saddle. But he crawled free and stood up, and there was Red Dillon saying, Yet I will cross me, and I'll break your goddamn neck. He struck Red Brill Dillon with his fist, knocked him down, and Red Dillon was not there. A horse was struggling on the ground, a big black bronc. It lifted its head, snorted bloody foam, and it said, A los muertos. Then its head fell back and with a thud and a sigh, and it was dead. He wakened, so tense his muscles screamed with pain. Then he felt the cold and the fiery bite of the needles, and he drew his knees up to his chest to feel his own warmth, and he slept again. He dreamed he was a boy, lost and crying, his loneliness beside the cold char of the lodge. Then the ruins of the lodge were gone, and he was sitting in the night, watching the flames of the barn tower toward the stars, and the stink of smoldering hay was in his nostril. Then it was in his mouth, the taste of hospital coffee, and Mary Redman was saying, Put away your tomahawk and take the feathers out of your hair. Then he started at the, stared at the white ceiling, which turned to a cloud of fine white ash, then to a cloud of stars, and he was awake again, awake and staring at the starry night sky through the juniper branches. Once more he slept and dreamed, and he was alone, walking over the earth in the night, he came to a mountain. He said, I have forgotten who I am. There was no answer. He said, I was the boy who went with Blue Elk and did what he said I must do. Again, there was no answer. I went with Red Dillon and de did what he said I must do. Still, there was no answer. I killed as they taught me to kill, he cried. 
and at last the mountain voice asked, Why? He was silent a long time. Then he said, I had to kill the past. I had to be myself. And now there is nothing left to kill except myself, for I did not kill the bear. Then the four colors, black and blue, yellow and white, were all around him, and the wind screamed, and the lightning shook the earth. The colors became men, and they made gestures to each other, to the four directions, then to the earth beneath and to the sky above, and then they began to dance the bear dance. A deer came and joined them, a deer with a gaping wound and one loin missing. It tried to dance, but its entrails dragged about its legs, and the bear came and wept for the deer. Then everything was gone except for the colors, and three of them faded, leaving only the white, and the mountain asked, Who are you? He could not answer, but a voice answered for him, He is my son. It was the voice of the All-Mother. Then he wakened, and the white was all around him, the white light of truth and understanding. And he saw frost on all the juniper branches, shining in the light of dawn. He lay there, at first not knowing where he was, then remembering. He sat up, crept out from among the junipers, too stiff with the cold to stand on his feet until he had rubbed life into his legs with handfuls of frosty juniper ne needles. He washed himself with the frosty needles, and... When the sun rose, he stared at it till his eyes were blinded, then sang the chant to the new day, singing softly to himself. Then he went back down the mountain. He went back to his camp, so weak from fasting that he had to stop often and rest. He went to his camp and opened his pack of supplies, but he did not eat. Having no cornmeal, he took a handful of flour, and he went down to the creek to a place where the deer might come to drink. He crouched beside the water and smoothed a patch of sand with his palm, then took a stick and drew a picture of a deer. He drew the picture and spoke to it, calling it by name, and said he needed its help. He said he had killed its sister and wasted her parts because he had forgotten who he was. He said that a man's memory is a faltering thing, but that now he had purified himself, and now he remembered. He scattered the flower over the picture, his offering to it, and he sang the deer chat. He said, I will be quick and merciful, brother dear, and I will use your parts as I should. Then he went back to his camp. He slept till late afternoon, still fasting. Then he put on a breech clout, took the rifle and the knife, and returned to the place where he had drawn the picture in the sand. He chose a place in the brush and sat down and made himself a part of the bushes. He sang no song. He thought no thoughts. He made himself a part of the earth and the evening, telling himself he must be strong enough to see when the deer came. Just before the light it was too dim to see the rifle's sight, they came two deer, does, and a buck. They came quietly down to the water. The does drank, making little ripples in the water. The buck watched them, waiting. One doe lifted her head, and water dripped from her muzzle and made little circles that spread and slowly floated away. Then the buck turned broadside and waited. His rifle was resting on his knee, but his hands were quivering. His eyes bleared. He forced himself to steadiness, and the shot shook the earth. The rocks and the trees trembled. The does were gone in one quick rush, but the buck stood for a long moment as though unhurt. Then it took one step, faltered, went to its knees, and fell with a long sigh of expended breath. Then there was silence. He crossed the stream, and his knife glinted in the thinning light. The buck's blood spilled from the slit throat, and he whispered, Earth, drink this blood that now belongs to you. He waited till the flow had stopped, then knelt and slipped the skin down the buck's breast and between its legs, and began to lay it back from the warm red meat. He butchered it in the old way, and he carried every part back to his camp. Then he broke his fast. He cooked and ate and slept.